So a really warm welcome to Sean White. Um, Sean, since 2014, has been um, a HEF clinical lead for the, the PENGE group of the BDA. Um, and during that time, he's been involved in, in the development of a number of different tools and resources on behalf of PENGE. Um, since 2004, he's been a member of the dietetic team within the um, Sheffield Home Central feed-in group. Um, and his particular interests are in the, the support of people with motor neuron disease um, and particularly with respect to supporting them whether um, over the difficult decision as to whether they should have a, a gastrostomy placed or not. So um, we're, we're delighted that Sean has recently been successful in being awarded um, an, 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 an NIHR, I always struggle with that word, uh, Clinical Research Doctoral Fellowship. So we look forward to seeing Sean's publications in the future, but over to you, Sean, now. Yeah, th thank you very much. Um, so, um, yeah, what I'm going to be speaking about for the next uh, 15 or 20 minutes um, is how we, we make the, the complex, emotionally complex um, and ethically complex decisions to um, start clinically assisted nutrition in people who don't have capacity to make the decisions themselves. And I'm going to refer to it as the term as in clinically assisted nutrition because that's what it's referred to in the professional guidance, but it's equally relative to enteral or parenteral nutrition. So before we get involved in making these decisions, we do have to have a really strong, good understanding of the under, underpinning law and professional guidance that guides how we should make these decisions. Um, with regards to the law, the most important bit of legislation is the Mental Capacity Act. And what this um, bit of legislation does is it protects patients to ensure if they do lose capacity that we do make these decisions in their best interests. It ensures that when we're making judgments about capacity that we're doing it in the right way and we're, we're justifying why we feel they do lack capacity. And it also gives patients and um, people the facility to make decisions about their future selves. So if they lose capacity in the future, they can lay down some preparation for that to make decisions about how they would feel and what interventions they might want in the future. But it also protects healthcare professional teams who are often involved in making these decisions. Um, and it protects us only if we follow the law and we follow the guidance that's laid down in front of us. When we don't do that, we do open ourselves open to, um, let ourselves open to sort of external scrutiny and maybe external criticism um, if we don't follow the processes that are very, very clearly laid down for us. The most important bit of guidance that we've got to rely on, which I think is an amazing piece of gut clinical guidance, I don't know about you, but I've read lots of clinical guidance which is a bit woolly, doesn't really direct me what to do, but I think this piece done by the, the BMA and RCP in 2018 really clearly lays out how we should make these best interest decisions for people who lack capacity. They give good case studies that we can all relate to, I think, um, regarding maybe people with strokes or neurodegenerative conditions and how we make these decisions. It gives a good summary of the case law, which has evolved over the last 30 years since the Bland case in 93 and to where we are now. And some really good practical tools, pro formers, um, sort of flow diagrams and patient information to help both healthcare professionals and families who are making these decisions. And for me, it's, it, I think it should be mandatory that you've at least read this guidance. It is 100 pages long, but you should have read this guidance if you're involved in any way in these decisions. So that's not just the decision makers but also supporting healthcare professionals and families really need to have an understanding as well. Before we even move forward into making best interest decisions we, there's a few steps that we should really have, have taken. So the first is is clinically assisted nutrition actually clinically indicated in this person who is in front of us or, or to flip that is it clinically futile? And it becomes clinically futile if we can't place the tubes to, to um, administer the feed or if the risks associated with placing the tube or starting clinically assisted nutrition um, are going to be too risky or if we, there's not going to be any clinical benefit from starting this intervention. And by clinical benefit, we need to consider the widest sense of the term. So not just clinical outcomes, but the patient themselves and what they would have accepted as, um, as appropriate or okay. 
Next, we need to make a judgment on this person's uh, mental capacity to make this specific decision at this point in time. And to do this, the Mental Capacity Act lays it very clearly out, the two-stage test that we can, we can follow to, um, to make this decision that they, they, they don't have capacity or they do. We should always assume that they do unless we can prove that they have, they're not. And so a person who, um, who hasn't got capacity is unable to understand, weigh up, or retain the information that we um, provide them about this decision, and they're unable to communicate it in it by any way. And if we, we need to make sure we're following that rigorous process and documenting it um, so that we are now establishing that this person no longer is the decision maker in this case. And with all these cases, we should always go into them with the strong presumption that it is in the best interests to prolong life. But however, there's a caveat in that, in that it's not necessarily any life. So the, it needs to be a life that this person would have valued and have wanted to continue and maybe extend through artificial means, because that's essentially what clinically assisted nutrition can do. And I think this statement's also something good to have in your mind when you're entering these processes, but because sometimes I think there is a fixation on the act of not giving or the act of withdrawing a treatment, where it's very clear in the law and also the guidance that what we really need to justify is whether it is in the best interest for them to start or continue the treatment. That's what we should be justifying, not justifying why we need to remove or not give it. And I think for this reason, it makes it really clear that it's irrelevant whether this person has a feeding tube in place or not. Because what we're doing is we're deciding whether they should be given this treatment at this point in time. The fact that we've given it before is a little bit irrelevant. We're making a new decision about whether we should continue it. Um, and I think that's a good thing to keep in mind when we're making these decisions, is that it's about the yeah, justifying that giving or continuing. So... It is a complex process. The law is complex, the guidance is complex, and it's lengthy. Um, and there are lots of stakeholders who are involved in this decision-making process. And we need to ensure that everybody has a shared understanding of the law and the best interest process before we start, so that we're all on that sort of level playing field. So for starters, that's healthcare professionals. We need to understand what the law and the, pro, um, the guidance tells us. We need to have experience in leading on these, um, on these best interest processes. And so we should be trained in, in that. And in my experience, there isn't, I guess, a lot of this training available. Um, I've also been in, in, in positions where I've had to maybe hold GP's hands through this. So at least recently, a GP told me in 30 years, they'd never had to make these sorts of decisions before, and they didn't feel prepared for it. Um, so I think training is really important and probably we could do better. And families, so this can be the first time families have come to making a really complex decision like this or being involved in making a decision. And they're making it in, in a really emotional time when their loved one has had an event. Um, and they need to understand what the process is. They need to understand what their role in the process is as well. So it's educating the families before we start, really important. And there is some really good guidance in the BMA um, guidance, uh, or really good leaflet, sorry, for in the BMA guidance that you can share with families. So let's say we've now established this person hasn't got capacity. Who becomes the decision maker? So you'll see next of kin, often written in patient notes, um, but next of kin has no legal status with regards to decision making, but often they are the people that we do need to consult with because they're you know, often the person's loved one who will understand and who know that person really well and be able to present that to the best interest process. But sometimes we need to correct any misconceptions that they are the decision maker and do that early and obviously in a very sensitive way. Has the person um, written down an advanced decision to refuse treatment in the past? Um, if it's valid, so if they've recognized that not having the treatment could um, shorten their life, if they've signed it and it's been witnessed and they had the mental capacity to make it in the first place, then we should treat that as if the, patient is, um, the person is um, telling us that themselves. And if it is a valid ADRT, then there's no need for a best interest process. The patient is the person making the decision. 
And if they haven't done that, is there a health and welfare lasting power of attorney? This assigns that responsibility to a, either a friend or a family member, it could be any individual really, um, and they become the decision maker. But what they can't do is just make a unilateral decision about this is what I think is best. They still need to follow the law, they still need to follow the guidance um, and um, assimilate all that like we would if the clinician was making the decision um, before they make a decision. But they essentially become legally the decision maker. In my experience, this is very rare that you see these statements, these decisions, or the LPAs, and often it's the clinician ultimately who becomes assigned the decision maker. In the acute setting, that's of, of, um, often the consultant. In the um, community setting, it's often the GP or palliative care. And I'm going to touch on quarter protection a few times, but if there is disagreement or conflict in this process, then we do have the quarter protection to go to to sometimes make these decisions. So who should be consulted? So we're going to get into the actual decision-making process here. And we should be consulting with anybody who is involved or has a vested interest in this person, who knows them, who understands their case clinically or from the family point of view. So from a clinic clinical team point of view, their role is to assess the patient, make a diagnosis, um, and maybe suggest a prognosis. What's their quality of life, their function going to be now? What's it going to be in the future? Um, what's their um, you know, scope for recovery? Um, what are the outcomes going to be with or without clinically assisted nutrition? And just as Cobb um, detailed these list of questions, which are really, really important to cover within that assessment. This was a, from a paper by Andrew Roachford, recent, which was a really nice paper um, about um, this, this, you know, this difficult area in practice, and he suggested we should be asking a really simple question. What are we trying to achieve by commencing clinically assisted nutrition or continuing it? We need to ensure that assessment that the clinical teams have made is, um, is simply communicated to the families using simple language so that everybody can assimilate that into their thinking. We shouldn't sugarcoat the, you know, the, the outcomes or the expected outcomes, so we should be realistic, we should be honest about what's, what, where this patient is and where they can potentially get to. And because there is often uncertainty with maybe recovery after a stroke, um, then we need to give a worst and best case scenario. And then we need to decide, if, is that best case scenario going to be good enough for this patient? Is this what they would have, would have wanted? This may open the door to trials of clinically assisted nutrition where you set clear targets about what you are trying to achieve. And if you don't achieve it, then maybe you need to review and decide whether it is something that needs to be continued. So the next, the most probably the most important group is the is the family, um, and the, the, we use the, what, the broadest sense of the term family when we talk about family. So not just blood relatives or um, spouses. Then we should be reaching out to anybody who knows that person, a family friend or a friend or a carer who has had conversation, understands what that person, who that person is, what they might have felt being given this really difficult choice. So we shouldn't be just going for the easy option, the one person who comes onto the ward to speak to the patient. We should be going further afield than that. Even if they haven't got capacity, then we should be um, involving the patients, if we can, using speech and language therapists so they can engage in the discussions as much as they can. And if there are no significant others, then we should recruit um, or invite in a, an independent mental capacity advocate who will ask all the questions that a family or a patient would have asked themselves about this intervention and also the scope for recovery. And we're doing all this to try and make a decision that's as close to what the person themselves might have made and that's in their best interests. And then we need to do something with all that information. The judge from the Blank case in 93 suggested a balance sheet exercise where you do a pros and a cons to starting or not starting treatment, withdrawing or continuing. And though we don't weight any of these items any more than the others, it just allows a very visual representation of what the pros and the cons are and can stimulate that discussion and hope you distill it down to the really important points. So we try and make that best interest decision. And if there is conflict, then we can go to the Court of Protection to make a decision. Um, and, and there is a good website where you can read some of the rulings from these um, cases uh, on, the, on, the, on the website. Documentation, as in any area, is really important. Um, there's a good pro forma in the BMA guidance which you can use. We should be documenting who was involved. How the decision made is really important so that we can see the process we follow to make this decision. And we can also share that process forward. 
We should be clear about what decisions being made, whether this is a trial, what outcomes are we um, judging ourselves on, and we should be sharing this information, not just amongst those who have just made the decision, but also forwarding it on to those who might have to review it or implement this in the, maybe in the community. So often we're implementing clinically assisted nutrition in the community setting. So we need to understand, as GPs, home mental feeding teams, understand how these decisions were made um, in the first place. And, and again, I'm not convinced that always happens. So the next, the last bit is the reviewing. So, you know, um, we should always be reviewing the decision. And again, this is something that doesn't routinely happen in my experience. It happens when a patient's condition changes or they're entering the end stages of their life. But the guidance is very clear that we should be revisiting these decisions every six to 12 months. Whose responsibility is that? I think that needs tidying up because at the moment it's no one's responsibility. So that's probably why it doesn't routinely happen. I think in the community you could make arguments for it being the GP or the acute teams that place the tube in the first place. We should review any goals that have been set. Are we meeting those? If not, should we think about withdrawing? We should assimilate new information. So is the patient improving? Is there more scope for recovery? Um, is there any new information that's come through from the, um, from the family? And repeat the whole with the same rigor that we made the first decision, not just lip service, repeat the whole process again, and we'd then make a, um, a new decision to continue the treatment or not. And it's the continuing that matters. If we decide not to continue, then um, we need to seek an independent second opinion. Um, they would re, um, assess the case and make sure we'd followed the right processes. If we do decide and there is consensus, then we can remove the treatment. We can remove that treatment without going to the Court of Protection now, since a ruling in 2018 in the Supreme Court. Um, and we need to ensure we put in place a good plan of palliative care so there's no suffering involved. So just in summary, just to finish off, um, I want to, the most important bit is that the process matters. It's not necessarily the decision, it's how we get to that decision that matters. We should involve all relevant stakeholders, not just those that are easily accessible. We need to document and share the process that we followed and the decision that we've been made so that we can then hopefully review that decision um, in full in the future. So that's me done. Thank you. Can we, just, can we just stay here? Yeah. Thank you so much, Sean. Can we just ask if there's any questions from either the floor? Um, I can't, cannot see any questions being posed via Slido, but thank you, David. Sorry. Can I ask a question? Sure. That's the gold standard, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But if you're actually involved in acute medical takes and everything, it's just chaos, isn't it? it the NHS is a firefighting machine and isn't, get, you know, we've had a a day of presenting and recognizing how under um, funded dietetic services are for example and to achieve that is it's a lot of time um, so I'm, I'm not sure how you get people round the table if you if any of us in this room think about just organizing an MST you want to bang your head off the wall trying to get six people to agree to meet for 20 minutes so how, how do you how do you really do that, Sean? How do you make that happen? So I agree, and I agree, you know, resources are sparse. So I think, you know, I think people are spending time making these decisions already. I just think, you know, and maybe it's just how we're spending that time, you know, using things like available, we've got proformers available to guide the process and make sure, and I'm sure lots of these things are being done, it's just maybe they're not always being documented as done. Um, mm. My experience was more in the community setting, and I've seen a really good examples of this and people making time because I think they recognise how, how important this decision is for people. Um, and I think once you get people in a room, and that's the key thing, is not doing it in piecemeal maybe, doing it through you know, individual conversations here and there. If we can just make that time for that hour or hour and a half that we need to really do this properly, really nail the decision, and then we know that is, you know, this, is, this, is, this is continuing a treatment which is going to continue to keep someone alive who may not want to have been kept alive, and that's huge. Um, so I think, I, I, I completely uh, um, accept the time thing, but I think it's time worth spending, to be honest, and, and it's law, we have to do it. Um, and at the moment, we're not open to maybe external scrutiny. I think if the CQC start coming in and have a look at how we make these decisions, then it will probably heighten the priority um, of how we do that. And that was one of the mm -hmm. recommendations of the guidance, and there was a recent um, Freedom of Information Act um, which looked at whether we do mm -hmm. this or not, and we don't, you know, um, and mm -hmm. it's something they recommend that we should be doing. So, because I'm very passionate about this area, I think 
I don't buy that as an excuse. I think we have to do this. It's so important. Yeah. Okay, well, on the, the note of the law, um, it's law that we keep to time, I'm afraid, Sean, <laughs> this afternoon. So thank, thank you. you. <laughs>